Good morning this morning. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have to say we've got one kid who's won a prize down at the fishing. He's already caught a tagged fish. Ooh, Excellent. Seven okay. o'clock. Today. <laughs> All right. Well done to him. What about yesterday? Oh, I think I, they put some photos up on the Facebook page and quite a few of the kids caught a fish. I had one coming just as we were packing up all the stalls. And he said, I've got a fish, I've got a fish, and he was jumping at the back. He was so excited. Are you allowed to take the fish with you or do you have to? Just this weekend. We normally practice catching the fish, but if you catch one this weekend, you can take it. There's a fish down there. I because when he delivered the fish, he showed me one of the tag ones. I knew what to look for. And one side. It was that long. long. But it was that fat. I, I don't think a kid would be able to pick it up. He'd be able to pick Well, this is Where good. Dinner, dinner, dinner is a, uh, looking good. I picked fish. up a swordfish, like a huge swordfish. Oh, okay. I do deep sea fishing. Well, good morning. This morning in this morning is a very fine morning. And it's the finest morning if ever there was such a morning. And if tomorrow morning is as fine as this morning, then tomorrow morning will be the finest morning if ever there was such a morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do to you, welcome everybody to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame for the Poet's Breakfast. I hope you have enjoyed your breakfast, what you've eaten so far. Yeah. Um, poetry is so much. And, and someone asked me once, well, actually it was a couple of young, a young fella in, in Gyra here, he would have been a teenager, and he said, what is poetry? And I said, it's hip hop. Well, it's like hip hop and stuff. Oh, and it kind of clicked. So in appealing to our younger audience today, I'm gonna start off some of my fishy tales with a little bit of hip hop poetry, and I'm gonna put a few beats behind it. Um, so, to begin with, um, let's start with a, a jazzy reggae beat, and this is because it's the poet's breakfast and tall fishy tales, like you just never know what is going to appear. Um, the next first one I'm going to do is the man and the dolphin. Here we go. Sand. He lived in 
inside the moment and his life was grand. He told them about the dolphin and what the dolphin said. The future, the past are out of reach like the sun, he heard it in his head telepathically. He sat inside the moment. He built a sand castle on the beach. The wave washed down, washed it down, and the sun is still out of reach. The wave washed up the beach, washed his sand castle down. He laughed and he built another one. And he never wore a frown. They found him in the morning. Just sitting on the beach, watching the sunrise. He said, enjoy the morning. And the sunrise, out of reach. Well, he just sat there and watched the flying bird. The waves washed down. And he didn't say a word. Sands go through the hourglass. You can't hold water in your hand. Just live inside each moment and make each moment grand. So yeah, that was a little something I wrote for my book um, that will be one I published, Seahorse Medicine. It's the same name as the cafe here, Seahorse Medicine Cafe. There's a bit of a story behind that because back in 2016 my bus was broken down. Oh no, it wasn't broken down that time. <laughs> it, was, it was in on Stradbroke Island. I was there for a festival and a friend woke up in the morning and came to me and she said, hey, I had this dream I went to the 233rd dimension and I was at the bottom of the ocean and I spoke with a seahorse and he said that you have seahorse medicine. I said, what does that mean? I don't know, it's just a dream. Well, after that, that, that very week, after the festival, someone came to my bus that I was living in and put this notepad, a book in there. And she said, oh, this is for you to get people's names and numbers as you're travelling and stuff. Oh, all right. Thanks very much. And in that book, I started writing. One day I wanted to write something, some words in my head, and I started writing and that was really the beginning of my poetry journey um, in this book that had Lionel Richie on the front and it said, is it me you're looking for? Um, so it was yeah, quite unusual, I guess. And um, then travelling in the bus, I wrote heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps, and heaps of poetry because I was in my own headspace all the time. Now the next one here, oh, I'm going to read to you a tall fishing story to begin with, and then I'm going to um, invite Steve Wordsmith up. Uh, a tall fishing story, and then one more little rap song. This one was simply titled Dennis. Fishing for a shoe in a canal in Venice, I fell into the canal and met a fish named Dennis. Dennis said, it's lovely to meet you, how do you do? And he said it in Italian as you'd expect an Italian fish to do. Because Dennis was a talking fish in an Italian canal, I think I must have hit my head when I slipped and fell. Dennis asked, why are you fishing for a shoe? I dropped it in the canal, what am I supposed to do? Well, you could have called a rescue fish to get it back. My cousin is a shoe rescue fish, and his name is Jack. But first, you haven't given me your name. I'm Thundercloud Repairian, and my mum calls me James. Speaking Italian in a canal with a fish named Dennis because I dropped my shoe in the canal in Venice, Dennis asks, do you want to come and play? He took me to a cool pool hall and we played pool all day. Because everybody knows fish love cool pools. And there were many fish there hanging out in schools, as well as a Jew fish who was playing 
a Jew's harp, and that was tuned to the key of F sharp. Plus, the octopus who was playing full pianos. There's so much more I could tell, and so my story goes. Dennis then suggested that we go on a space trip. And that was when I thought, oh, I've really lost my grip. The octopus was the pilot of the UFO, and we teleported there faster than you can say slow. We were on a fishy planet that was ruled by whales, and it's the truth, and it's not one of my fishy tales. The sun was setting fast, and the night was getting dark, when who should arrive but the bioluminescent shark, and a bioluminescent dogfish who would both provide the light for the party with the whales, and Dennis that night. We drank prawn cocktails of krill oil and crab. Dennis, oh, geez, he really has the gift of the gab. And when the party was over, we just teleported back to Venice, me, the pianist octopus as the pilot, and the talking Italian fish named Dennis. Dennis then suggested that we go to the virtual reality arcade to see how two-headed midget elephants are made. You don't even want to know about the purple flamingo that was riding on a merry-go-round with a guitar playing dingo and a two-headed midget baby elephant birth in a virtual reality replica of the entire planet Earth. My day with Dennis the talking fish was totally weird. I pinched myself to see if I was awake and I pulled my beard. And when I awoke the next day, I was at home. In my bed, was it real or was it just a dream instead? Can you imagine such a bizarre situation? I did. It's all from my imagination. <laughs> all right, thank you. And now I'm going to do one more song one. All right, well, I'm going to do one more song one um, before I invite Steve Worksmith up. And this is the seahorse scene. It's a reggae? It is. It's a. <laughs> I really like reggae. I really enjoy it. Particularly with the, the palm tree. Mm -hmm. With the palm tree. Yeah. Um, So reggae guitar, instrumental hip hop, use of Libra production skills beats by skills beats. Well, one day I was sitting under a tree. I decided to go for a swim in the sea. I dived right in and to my despair there was Bits of plastic floating everywhere. Seahorse came and he swam up to me. He said, there's plastic everywhere, it's killing me. I listened to the seahorse choking there. He said, your human pollution is everywhere. There's poisonous plastic all through the sea. It's hurting much more than you can see. Little bits of plastic look like krill. The whales eat it. It's making them ill. There's broken plastic all through the sea. It's killing the animals. There's bits stuck in me. There's so much bioaccumulation. PCBs in every human and every nation. Human pollution right through the sea, making all animals sick, killing you, killing me. Human poisonous chemicals everywhere. Are you all stupid? Why don't you care? I listened to the seals, he said, clean up the lands, clean the oceans, the earth, be nurturing humans. The seals said, thunder cloud, you must yell out, tell the people to stop putting litter about. Reduce, reuse, recycle your waste, I really don't like this plastic ocean taste. The seals said, thunder cloud, you must be vocal, buy plastic free produce and buy it all locally. Humans don't stop polluting the sea. You won't be able to swim here with me. There was one thing that the seahorse said to me. He said, look after the planet. Walk very softly, recycle your waste, reduce, repair, what you can. Make sure only your footprints are left in the sand. Seahorse swam away. 
He winked at me. I walked up the beach and I picked up three bits of plastic sometimes and left behind, not thinking of the earth, but the nurturing kind. I was spotted by a ranger hid behind a tree. You grunt, you let your plastic pie free. The ranger was given the grunt a little in fine. He winked at me for being so kind. The ranger said I am. Made his day, you must have spoken to the seahorse, eh? I sat under the tree, started to think. The ranger walked away and gave me a wink and all that was going. Around in my head was what the wink of the seahorse and what the seahorse said. See, I haven't been around the world, but I've been around the block. I don't know it all, but I know a bloody lot. I don't have a house or a place of a boat, but well, I do have a place down the back. But I spend most of the time on the side of the road. I'm an outback poet just moving around with my heart in the bush and my feet on the ground. I've travelled this land from the top to the bottom. I've been to the Murray, I've seen the cod rotten. I've travelled from east and I've travelled from west. I've travelled with zeal and I've travelled with zest. And it's always good to meet people like James. I have these little tales that I tell. Like all people alive have some talent. From where it comes, it's not known. Some sing and dance or act our romance. It's a party of life like a poem. When telling the joke is your forte or telling the humour of life or paint a beautiful landscape or serenade the friends in your life, Yes, counts part of our makeup becomes natural in the things that we do, not always in the things expected, and not always in the things that we choose. It's really good to be here in Gyra. I love the um, mother of duck lagoons and such around the back, and it's, it's good to see all the water birds and go for a wander around there. Uh, James himself went for a wander around the lagoon not too long ago. It was, uh, yeah, classic. It's lovely to be in Gyra. This little country town. Country towns, I've travelled right around this country, all over through the little country towns, and uh, Gyra is really, yeah, it's nice. Bit nippy at times, but not bad. Not bad. I met him first near Warren working on a start out farm. He was skeletal and sallow, lean of shame and long of arm. Wide lips and flared out nostrils that bespoke his native blood, a battler. Scratching hard existence in his land of drought and flood. Where he won a tight survival chasing rabbits day and night. He had no gun nor ammunition. You to knock him out in flight with a waddy for a weapon. Jump or rock was just the same. And he'd grab that groggy bunny and he'd say, that was deadly aim. Sell them off his target, gave those spielers a little rest in them knock and sock them alleys in the showground out the west. The day that I enlisted, he was standing next to me and I heard him tell the captain that his name was Darkie Lee. Or oh, often quiet and moody, lonely in a crowd, no doubt, or perhaps a different colour made him feel the odd man out. 
but he was a willing soldier and a dinkum cobber too. Like the night the MPs caught us at that Swy game in the loo. Yeah, you nailed that provost sergeant cold as any side of meat with a well-aimed whiskey bottle at the range of 20 feet. Mighty quick we were escaping in a herd, our mate explained, as we scarpered through the alleys. Fellas, that was deadly, aim. Then our mob embarked a service to a land across the sea where the final call awaited for that bloke called Darby Lee. It was at the Flanders dust up a place called Blardner's Court. We copped a bad position. Yeah, men cut out off without support and that enemy machine gun keeping up a steady fire, safe and sound in their encampment behind barricade and wire. Flat we lay like bloody lizards on that piece of shell like plain and that enemy machine gun pelted lead like summer rain. Well, our choice was die like heroes or the white surrender flag. When our officer decided it was time to sky the rag, take your choice, a German prison, or a group of unmarked mounds when this bloke goes racing past me like a hare before the hounds strike me blue, but it was dark. Like an emu crouching low, in his right hand was a grenade swinging ready for the throw, no cover to protect him, dashing, daring as you please, where those Mitchell hours of chatting the bullets on like bees, and fair into that enemy gun pit, he dispatched his first grenade. Screams were heard from brave men dying as that scarlet blossom burst. Then he sent them up another just as quickly as the first German gunner or rabbit. It was all the same to our champion Woody Chucker. He maintained his deadly aim. Then the dying spurt of gunfire rang the bell on darkness. By the time the medics got there, he was very nearly gone, though his belly parts were punctured, his heart was hanging on, and in final grief we listened to the gasps that shook his frame, and the final words he uttered, fellas, that was dead man. Just another unsung hero, gone unhallowed and unsung, one of many number when the final curtain rung, native son with small ambition, or our heart's decree, a soldier with the true tradition. Rest on top, Darby Lee. I was asked the other day to do something. Now, see, I used to be the, the Tenerfield cobbler at one stage. And there was, um, you know, I used to make shoes and things like that. And I was talking to the Tenerfield saddle and we come up with the oracles of the bush. That was our storytelling thing from 20 years ago in Tenerfield. And anyway, I was asked to write a poem, and I wrote a poem about it, and it wasn't very well accepted by the people there because it was talking about an icon of Australia. And, and you've got to be careful when you start thinking about it. See, people say, where did a place like you come from, a bloke like you come from? I was brought up in the country in the place called Wedderburn, on the side of the Georges River with the stags and the elks and the ferns. There wasn't many luxuries, no, things weren't very plush, but we had this long drop dunny called the orifice of the bush. There's one thing that I know for sure, and I spent a lot of time just doodling in the dirt there, and I even wrote some rhyme, a place to fantasise and figure out but everything was true. I hide out from the washing up like young lads often do. I'd always lift the lid up to avoid a bit of fright to eradicate the chances of the dreaded red back bite. Like mum's old chook, I'd settle in with me pants around me knees to the sound of the neighbour's rampant bull and fruit bats in the trees. Like a medieval king, I'd sit upon his gilded throne, my favourite place, I must admit, in our lovely country home. Yes, I'm a connoisseur of dunnies. Of this it is a fact. A place to try, a place to check, before I hang my hat. I remember when I left the bush in a council house in town, there was an outhouse out the back. Yeah, a place to settle down. It wasn't quiet as our country home, but it had all the mods and cons. Running water, electric light, and an oven to cook scones. I'd only been there a week, I think, when I awoke with an awful fright. There was a shadow past the window in the middle of the night. I'd heard about these prowlers and their low-down thieving tricks, but they'd taken on the wrong bloke this time, this lad from out the sticks. 
Well, I hit the floor running. There wasn't time to put on clothes. I'll hit that flaming larrikin and I'll probably break his nose. Through the front door quietly, the blood was pumping fast. I'd stop him at the gate, I thought, as the bare feet hit the grass. He was running up the footpath with his booty on his back. I'd played rugby in his school days and I'd stop him in his track. Well, I hit him round the ankles and he had nowhere to go. Yeah, I dropped him like a dummy lid and all he said was, No! The smell was something awful. I'd never live it down. I'd nailed the poor old dummy man and I dropped him on the ground. There was excretion all across the grass and right across the road. The lid had left the dunny can and he dropped the flame and light. <laughs> well, throughout my years of wandering, I think I've tried the lot. There's the environmental sound ones, there's flush lavatories and there's pots. But there's collectors of pubs, of pins, of bottle stamps and plants. But I'm the international. Now, Universal Secretary of the place, you drop your pants. I've tested loos across this land and I've tried the loos abroad. There's the ones you pull the chain on, there's authentic ones, and there's frauds. <laughs> but there's nothing in comparison when you have to strain and push as a good old Aussie dunny in the orifice of the bush. Well, you know, it's, it's always good to uh, spin a, a, a humorous sort of a yarn, isn't it, you know, and, and poets' breakfasts are great for spinning yarn, humour. Um, is, are we going to have some other people come up and do some poetry? Uh, yeah, I, I can do another one, James. Yes, please, another one. please do. Please. And then, yeah, sure. Yeah, and then I'll come on up and introduce the next person. Mm. Yeah, it's always good around, around these shearing areas and such to tell stories of, of shearers and things like that, you know. There once was a shearer by the name of Louis the Brick. He was a devil for work and a devil for drink. He could shear his 200 a day without fear and drink without wigging four gallons of beer. Now Jimmy the barman who served out the drink, he just hated the sight of him, Louis the Brick. He stayed much too late and he came much too soon in the morning and the night and the daytime and at noon. Well, one day when Jimmy was cleaning the bar with sulfuric acid that he kept in the jar, old Louie come yelling and bawling with thirst, whatever you've got, Jim, just give me the first. Well, it ain't in the histories and it ain't put in print, but Louie drank acid with never a stint. Said, that's the stuff, Jimmy, will strike me stabbing dead. That'll make me the ring receiver some shit. Well, all that long day as he served out the beer, poor Jimmy was worried with his troubles and fear. Too worried to argue, too anxious to fight. All he could see was his corpse in his fright. Well, early next morning as he opened the door, along came the shearer, he was yelling for more. With his eyebrows all singed and his whiskers deranged and holes in his hide like a dog with the mange. Said Jimmy, and how'd you like that new stuff? Said Louis is fine, but ain't had enough. It gave me great courage to shear and to fight. But every cough set me whiskers alight. I thought a new drink, but it must have been wrong, for what you gave me was proper and strong. It set me to coughing, and you know I'm no liar, but every cough set me whiskers on fire. Thank you. So this was written um, 
at 11.33 on the 13th of the 11th, 2020, um, for, which is not his birthday, but it was for my son's birthday um, last year. <laughs> his name's Sasha, um, and that's why this one's called Sasha Seagulls. Um, it also has um, music to it, so uh, yeah, shall we go? Sasha Seahawks. This is Ben Maker, Ocean Rap Instrumental Hip Hop Beat from YouTube. Sasha Seahorse was thought of as strange, a strange Sasha Seahorse believed he could bring about change. I'm Sasha Seahorse, a nurturing man, I give my love freely because I can. One full moon night the sea became rough. Cyclone hit the reef and sea life was tough. The ship became wrecked and stuck on the reef. Sasha Seahorse could see this could cause grief. Sasha Seahorse said, I help when there's strife, I can bring about change by saving one life. Just one seahorse can bring about change. I'm a nurturing seahorse, this isn't strange. So Sasha Seahorse swam into the deep, darkest part of the ocean where the dolphins sleep. He woke all of the dolphins and said, come with me, we've sailors to rescue from the cyclonic sea. They swam to the reef, they looked about and they heard a sailor give a stricken shout. So the dolphin swam over and picked up the man and swam in through the storm to the dry land. And Sasha Seahorse said, I can help when there's strife. I can bring about change by saving one life. Just one seahorse can bring about change. I'm a nurturing seahorse. This isn't strange. Well, I rescued the sailors working through the night. Sasha Seahorse coordinated the rescue and the helicopter flight. Not one life was lost and everyone was saved. Sasha Seahorse got a medal for being so brave. Because Sasha Seahorse said, I can help when there's strife, I can bring about change. I'm saving one life, just one seahorse can bring about change. I'm an urgent seahorse. This isn't strange, Sasha Seahorse said, I can help when there's strife, I can bring about change. I'm saving one life. One seen horse can bring about change. I'm a nurturing seahorse. This isn't strange. You see, you know the male seahorse is the one that carries the babies and does the pregnancy? I guess that's kind of what seahorse medicine means. Adopting your inner creator and your unconditional love. Sasha Seal said, I can help when there's strife. I can bring about change by saving one life. Just one seahorse can bring about change. I'm a nurturing seahorse, and this isn't strange. Oh. All right, and now we're going to invite Mark Spencer up here. Come on up, Mark. Do you want the uh, back turn? Oh, I'll go. very famous poem. It's very famous to the Germans. This is written in German. And it's become particularly famous 
because Schubert put it to music. And so I did a bit of research around this piece, it's called The Trap. Now, just to let you in on a few, few things, I'm going to read it first in English and then in execrable German because I'm not a German speaker and I've tried my very best to master it in German. What I, what I noticed as I, was, as I was reading the German was I thought, how can English be a Germanic language? Mm. I, it just, to me, there's no resemblance to German, to modern German. And anyway, so that's okay, I've thought about it. Oh, language warning, language warning. English is probably the most bastardised Mongol language on the planet. We have a vocabulary that's three times the size of the next language with the, with the, long, with the largest vocabulary, and that's Mandarin. We have three times the number of words. And that's because we steal everybody else's words. The English world, um, they're a mongrel race. That, that, there was the, you know, there was the ancient Britons, there was the Romans, there was the Norse who came in, there were the Danes, the Vikings, oh, the Scots, uh, the Celts, the ancient Britons. It's, it, and then of course, modern Britain is a very multicultural society. So anyway, it all started off, I suppose, around about the fifth century. The Romans had called their legions home because they had the Goths and the Huns trying to take over the place. So they called their legions home and they left Britain. Well, some Britain, some Romans remained and they, and they then started to intermarry with the Celts to a great degree. So I believe, so I'm told, or I read. And around about the mid fifth century, oh my gosh, the Norsemen decided to arrive, cause a bit of trouble. Because they were in the Scandinavian Peninsula, breeding like rabbits, and the Scandinavian Peninsula are not very fertile. <clears throat> Nevertheless, these Norse had command of the sea in those boats that they can sail and they can, they can row. Anyway, Without, without boring the seller, what I want you to do is when you're listening to first the English version, which I think is, English is not a very attractive language. What I want you to do is then when I read the German version, is to see if you can find the places where it's clear that, it's, that English is a Germanic language. It, it derives its roots from German. Okay, we'll see how we go. The trap. In a bright little book, there shot in merry haste a capricious trap, passed it like an arrow. I stood on shore and watched in sweet peace the cheery fishes bay in the clear little book. A fisher with his rod stood at the waterside and watched with cold blood as the fish swam about. So long as the clearness of the water remained intact, I thought, he would not be able to catch the trout in his fishing rod. But suddenly, that thief, he grew weary of waiting. He stirred up the brook and made it muddy, and before I realised it, his fishing rod was twitching. The fish was squirming now. And with rage and blood, I gazed at the deceived fish. At the golden fountain of youth, you linger so confidently. Ah, oh, but think of the trout. And if you see danger, flee. Mostly it is from lack of cleverness that maidens miss the angling seducers. So beware. Otherwise, you may be too late. Okay. Die Freude. 
in einem Becken heller, der Schoß und frei Ei. Die Lonische Fräder vorüber wie ein Einfall. Ich stand in Gott und dem Gestade und sah und Susuru, der Mugen Fisches Bad im Klaren der kleinen Süd. Ein, ein Fischen mit der Luta, wo an dem Ufer stand. Er saß mit kaltem Blut auf, bis sie das Fischlein warnt. So dachte ich nicht gebringt, so fand er die Freier mit seiner Handel nicht. Doch ein Leib wurde dem Dieber. Der Sub so lang gemacht, das Becklein tückisch drüber und eigentlich wird gedacht. So sucht sein Mutter das Fischlein sehr da dran. Und ich mit Regenmutter sah die Bezüge an. Nur die Rock und Keller, der sich in Jugend wird. Dann doch um die Fräler, sind ich gefasst so eigentlich. Mist fehlt ihm mehr als Mangel. Der Klugheit macht ihn zu. Verhüre mit der Handel, soll sich blüten. Okay, thanks very much for coming in. Well, and thank you very much, Mark. That was really, German was really well done. Mm. Yeah. All right, well, um, the next one I'm going to do before I invite Gladys Wilson up um, is again, it's something that I've just written in this last week specifically for the Trout Festival. Um, and it's called Dead Jellyfish. And I'm going to do this one also with um, a hip hop beat. So I'm going to put this one to a hip hop beat, which is. Um, All right, not the hip hop one. Excellent. Yeah, Jellyfish. Jellyfish instrumental hip hop beat by the BD Productions. Fish all floating free. The 
this was the thought going around in its head. I have never seen a jellyfish dead. The jellyfish was in deep concentration, thinking very deeply about his situation. I'm a jellyfish with no arms, legs, eyes or head. I haven't got a mouth and I can't say my name's Fred. <laughs> a jellyfish was thinking thoughts very cute. I'm androgynous, bisexual and I've never had a room. I have no genitalia. I haven't even got a bed. I'm floating in an ocean and I'll never get ahead. A clear jellyfish met a jellyfish that's blue and the blue one said to the clear one, I can see right through you. The clear one replied, that's no way to address a parent. And the blue jellyfish replied, but my parents are transparent. A jellyfish was floating in the sea with his friends. And this is where my jellyfish story ends. A total ate the jellyfish. It went inside his head. That's why you rarely see a jellyfish. Dead. I've never seen a jellyfish. Dead. That's what was going through his head. That's why you'll never see a jellyfish dead inside a turtle's head. Never see a jellyfish dead. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite Gladys Wilson up here for a very special performance from Gyra's own original poem. Just bear me a little thought, 
as you glance at my ragged old body where many battles have been fought. That uh, we have fought. But of course I'm not what I used to be, but surely I can trust that you will not cut me down and turn me into sawdust. As my root shorts start to tremble now, the weeping branches hang low, and still I dread to think of that terrible day when I might have to go. As I wake up each morning and thankfully take another breath, I pray that you will leave me here just to die a natural death. Now looking to my future, whatever that may be, but I always will remain a precious old gum tree. I do have another one here, this is my latest, and this is um, a road map of life. And I think I finished, I just finished it, I think on last Wednesday to Tuesday morning or something, I think. Oh no. I've got to stuck together with something in here. Right. A road map of life. Our lives are like a road map with many twists and turns as we follow the winding pathway. There's still much more to learn. But the challenge in life, of course, is a challenge that's now placed in our hands to guide us through good and bad times as this great universe expands. There are many bends we must navigate on this never-ending road as you share together the burden to lighten a heavy load. Now in the ever-changing world, we still should have a choice to stand up and be counted all sweet with just one voice. Even sometimes, though, we need to stay strong and take comfort from those around us when little things go wrong. Never take our time on earth for granted, as one very wise man once said, and always be aware of those warning signs ahead. But Father Time waits for no one. He knows the reason why as the old clock on the mantelpiece keeps ticking as each day passes by. As we all look forward to a brighter future, that's part of our master plan. So let's stand together united to do the best we can. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Jack. I'll get I'm a nervous wreck this morning, you can understand. <laughs> well, we're just about out of posts on the home, but I've got a few more I can do. First one is, well, some, another one, a little one that I wrote this week, and it's a bit of a tall story, tall fishing story. Called Smells Like Sardines. So a man went fishing and, and he threw his line out and when he pulled it in, he caught a trout. So he threw his line in again and made a wish. I wish that I could catch a really, really, really big fish. He pulled his line in and he caught a sardine. Like no sardine had ever been seen, not 10 centimetres, but three whole metres of world record sardine and a very big eater. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you have to have a tall fishing story, not just a spin. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that, Gladys. No just watch out for the call oh. as you're going down. Yes, I'll be fine. And, um, <laughs> Uh, I've, got, I've got one more that I'm going to do. Actually, I've got two more. Um, and then I'll do the one about the porpoise. A porpoise asked, what's your purpose? I replied, create and do the things I love with love and eliminate all hate. And my purpose, Mr. Porpoise, is to be myself, nurture and care for my own inner health. And live in the present moment as an example for all to see. My purpose, Mr. Porpoise, is to create with love and just be me. The porpoise asked me, Thunder Clown, have you eyes upon the end? I replied, Porpoise love is the means to an end, and if I create from the heart and act with love, I'll manifest the life I love inspired from above. Yeah. Oh, that's not Julius. I want to introduce you to Julius.
Julius over here on the table. Julius, the flying giraffe. Now, when I wrote Julius Giraffe, I was trying to think, oh, what rhymes with giraffe? James Giraffe, George Giraffe, Gary Giraffe, and then, oh, uh, oh, Julius, that's one of my, my other sons. Not Sasha, my other one's Luca, and one of his middle names is Julius, because he was born in July. Um, so, yeah, Julius is not just a normal giraffe, he's a flying giraffe, and I'm going to put a bit of music with this one as well. Disney's Jungle Cruise. As soon as this ad's over. See, Julius Giraffe was often found trying to lift himself up off the ground because Julius Giraffe had a dream of flying. He never gave up hope or gave up trying. Julius Giraffe wanted to fly, so he plotted, planned, calculated and applied, but no matter how much he flapped his legs around, Julius never got off the ground. Julius Giraffe decided to see if he'd fly like a bird, if he jumped from a tree, but Julius Giraffe wasn't a goat. His chance of climbing a tree was quite remote. The baboon yelled out, Julius, giraffes can't fly, no matter how much you try and you try. Julius Giraffe, you're tall and red, you can see far and wide across this here land, your skinny giraffe legs weren't built for flying, give up on your dream before you die trying. Give up on your dream before you die trying. Julius Giraffe wasn't looking out, didn't see the poachers lurking about. Next thing he knew, Julius woke up in a cage on the back of a poacher's truck. He cried for his family and the baboon. In the rain on the plane during the monsoon, he was stolen from Africa, taken away, put in an aeroplane. We flew that day. The moral of the story, listen to this, be very discerning for what you wish. The plane suffered engine failure, went into a dive. The pilot bailed out, he wanted to stay alive. Julius Giraffe was in luck and found the last parachute. Well, he wingsuited down and he flew through the air, glided with birds in the loop, the loop, and his voice was heard yelling, I'm a flying giraffe, I'm in the sky, fantastic, amazing, I'm a giraffe who can fly. I can fly. Never give up 
on your hopes and your dreams all come true in the most unexpected way it seems. Oh. On a high note, with the flying giraffe. Um, although, I guess I can do one more. Um, yeah, this one's just come up because Steve did one about a dunny before, and it, it smells a bit fishy in here, so it's still still a bit stinky. This is about froggy flat though. A peaceful place is froggy flat, and my story is quite funny about a man called Phil McColl who fell head first in the dunny. It was a dark and lonely night, this is not a joke, because Phil walked to the toilet, the dunny made a croak. He turned his phone torch on and opened up the door and as he walked inside the dunny croaked once more. The dunny kept on croaking in the middle of the night. He shone his torch about to find everything all right. It was a long drop compost toilet with not a pleasant smell. And as he opened up the lid, he tripped and his phone fell. It was dark inside the dunny, but he knew his phone was right. It had landed on the sawdust and Phil could see the light. He went back to the kitchen and got a pair of tongs his feet were cold, so he put on a pair of thongs. But in the dark, he couldn't see the thongs belonged to his wife. They were too small and the cause of the coming strike. His wife awoke to an empty bed and also needed to pee. And in the dark, she donned Phil's thongs because she couldn't see. In Froggy Flat, the dunny is far down the garden path. In Phil's big thongs, Mrs. McColl slipped and fell flat. <laughs> Phil was in the head, head first in the toilet and he was leaning in, reaching for his phone when Mrs. McCull burst in, saw her thongs on Phil and she began to yell and in surprise Phil lost his grip and that was when he fell, head first down the toilet and landed on his phone, he wiped it off and then he found that he wasn't alone. There inside the dunny, there was a giant green tree frog staring him in the face and croaking on a log. <laughs> Mrs. Mac looked down the hole and said, What can I do? I'm busting for a pee and I really need to poo. I've got a turtle head and it's starting to poke out. Call the SES, you stupid woman, Phil began to shout. Mrs. Matt got angry, pulled up her nighty and had a sit. She let it rip and Phil got covered in more shit. She went back to the kitchen, made a cup of tea and after an hour called the SES and Phil's mates to come around and see. They had to dig him out as Phil was firmly stuck with a pump and excavator in the local sewage truck. That afternoon, Phil McColl was free and gave a happy shout. He'd been stuck in poo for 14 hours before they finally dug him out. A peaceful place is froggy flat, but you won't find Phil McColl. The locals now refer to Phil McColl as Phil Me Hole. <laughs> Thank you very much everyone for coming in. There's one thing I must do because I was a little nervous at, at the beginning and I totally forgot to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Camilleroy and the Bandai nearby and acknowledge the continuing connection of elders past, present and emerging to the land but I'm glad I've removed it right at the end. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a lovely Sunday. Thanks for coming to the show breakfast.
They work, don't they? They work really yeah. well. Mm. That's what I used to do in Nimbin in, when I had the restaurant. I'd have the music, I'd have to do my poetry in between like shifts and stuff like that. It's set to the music. It really brings it out even more. Oh, yeah. See ya. See ya. See ya. Mm. All right, I'll just turn off these.